Welcome back. I'm here with several members of the Faculty of Applied Science who are going to share with you their amazing research and just some of the ways that engineers are making an impact in our world. This research is very often interdisciplinary, meaning people from different engineering disciplines or different faculties like science and medicine can all work together. Many of your professors in university will be research faculty as well, meaning that they spend time in the classroom teaching you, as well as doing some research, like publishing journal papers and working to solve the problems that we face in the world every day. They're taking what they learn in their research and applying it when they teach your class. So hopefully these very short introductions to just some of the research happening in our faculty will give you a better insight into the variety of topics a degree in engineering may allow you to explore. Engineering research and the application of this research is truly changing our world for the better. So with that, I'll invite our first research spotlight to the stage. And at the end, you'll be able to use the Q&A on the right in the stage to ask some questions. Good morning, everyone, and thanks for joining us uh, this session this morning. My name is Pat Kirchen. I'm an associate professor in mechanical engineering. Um, I work with topics related to energy emissions and anything to reduce the environmental impact of systems on our environment. Today, I'm going to talk a little bit about alternative fuels and freight emissions and what we can do to that sector where it's hard to go to things like electric vehicles because the systems are so big or they use so much energy. Before we do that, I'd like to acknowledge that I'm calling in today from the traditional, ancestral, and unceded territories of the Tuasin First Nation, and a lot of the work that I'll be talking about today was carried out on the Salish Sea. So my lab, it's got a lengthy title, it's the Thermochemical Energy Conversion Lab, but all of this is centered around that one goal I already mentioned, minimizing the environmental impact of practical energy conversion systems. And that can include many different ways of doing that. One of them is we'll develop practical technologies, like new ways of using an engine, new fuels to use, maybe a new sensor, or just a new method or a new technology. The next big thing we do is we generate actionable data. And what I mean by actionable data is I mean information that we get to the right people at the right time so they can make the right decisions to reach this goal of minimizing the environmental impact. And I'll show you an example of that today. And probably the biggest thing that we do and the part that I'm most proud of is training highly qualified people, our students. The students that do the research that I'll show you today graduate and then they go out and work in various sectors sometimes very technical industries, sometimes in more regulatory bodies, and they help drive the change that we need moving forward in sustainability. Today, I'll tell you some work about internal combustion engines, where we do need to do work for sustainability and using alternative fuels. You can see over here some of the tools that we use, but I won't go into those individually. So in my lab at, at the University of British Columbia campus in Vancouver, we have an engine with a very unique hole in the side of it. So this is a single cylinder engine, roughly the same size as what would be in a heavy duty semi truck, but there's a hole and that hole gives us a window that we can look inside of the engine and watch the combustion as it's happening. And I could spend hours talking about this and sometimes I do, but not today. Today, all I can do is show you a couple of pictures of what combustion looks like for different fuels. And here's an example of biodiesel, which is a lot like diesel. And we understand a lot of that, how it burns, how the emissions are produced, how we can make it more efficient simply by looking at these high speed images. But as we look to decarbonize and use fuels with lower greenhouse gas emissions, we have to start understanding how they burn as well so that we can apply the same sort of technologies and same sort of engineering methods to reduce their emissions and increase their efficiency. These other pictures here are showing you an example of natural gas being burned at different pressures. And again, I could talk for hours about this, but what we learn from this is how we should use natural gas, which has lower greenhouse gas emissions than diesel, and eventually we'll be using renewable natural gas, how we should burn that in an engine so that we get low emissions and high efficiency, and again, reach that goal of minimizing the environmental impact. That was in the lab. The other part of our work is in the field. Here, what we do is we take our instrumentation and our methods that we've developed in the lab and we bring them to vehicles that are using regular and new alternative fuels in practice, in the real world. And you can see here we're in the engine room of a large ship. Uh, these are the exhaust systems of the ship engines. There's two of them. We draw exhaust gas out of that and pass that to all of the sensors uh, to measure different emissions. In this case, we were looking at the greenhouse gas emissions, so CO2 and carbon monoxide and, and methane on this natural gas vessel. These sensors that we have here, they may look a little bit prototypical and that's because they are. Uh, these are systems that we've developed in the lab, validated in the lab and then taken the field to measure very specific components of the exhaust gas, methane, CO2, carbon monoxide, and so on. 
The other thing you'll notice here is Nick. Nick is a graduate student in my lab. He finished his undergraduate degree at UBC in mechanical engineering, and he joined our team to carry out these measurements in the field. He also developed a lot of the sensor that's down here on the floor, and we'll be deploying that tomorrow on another vessel. So what I'd like to do next is show you some examples of what we can learn from these types of measurements. Now, this is the only really busy science -y graph that I'm going to show you today, and I'm going to take my time walking through it. What we're looking at is how the greenhouse gas emissions reduce as we try different things. And the way we quantify that is looking at the total number of CO2 tons that this vessel would emit as it sails from Vancouver to Vancouver Island and back. And most vessels would do that with diesel. And this gives you some baseline number, something like 17 tons of CO2 equivalent. If we start using natural gas, depending how we operate, those emissions go up. And you can see it's quite a bit more. We have lower CO2, which is the blue, but we have a lot of methane emissions and methane is a particularly bad greenhouse gas, and that's what's shown in red. And so we did this measurement back in 2018, and we saw, oh goodness, we have this increase in methane emissions. What are we going to do about that? So we worked with the operator, the vessel owner, as well as the engine manufacturer to come up with technologies and methods to reduce those emissions. And that's what the rest of this, this graph shows you. And I'm going to actually jump forward a little bit, first to here. And what this is doing is this is saying, let's change how the engine operates. That's those technology developments to improve the methane emissions. You see how those went down significantly. And now it's roughly on par with the diesel engine back in 2018. That's what we call a technological change. We're changing the technology used by the engine to, to manage the combustion and thus the emissions. Now, the other thing you'll notice is up here, it says standard operation. Standard operation is referring to how the engines and the vessel are being used. And this is something very much decided by the operator and the ship crew. These ships have two engines. One of them is they're, they're always on so that you have redundancy. But when you have them always on, that increases the emissions. The other thing is it's a ferry. So it's carrying cargo into a port that gets unloaded and reloaded and sails back. And while the vessel's in port, they leave the engines on. Now to get around that, you can do two things. You can turn off one of the engines that reduces the emissions and you can use electrical power at the shore. This operator did that very quickly, you can see what can happen, the massive reductions you get by doing that, as well as been combining those reductions with the technological changes. So when we compare to where we are last year or now, that's this green arrow to where we were in 2018, you can see almost half, 50% reduction in the total greenhouse gas emissions, both for natural gas and for diesel. And compared to diesel, we're still saving a significant amount as well. So this is one big step towards reducing greenhouse gas emissions from this sector. And maybe I'll just point that this big arrow here, if we look at one vessel sailing back and forth for a full year, that's like taking 3,000 cars off the road for a full year. So the savings that we can realize by using these types of technologies and op <coughs> excuse me, operational measures can have a very significant impact. The next thing we're looking at is expanding this to beyond just natural gas and just beyond ferries and looking at many different fuels and many different types of vehicles. In particular, we're worried about urban freight emissions because in urban systems, vehicles operate differently than how they're designed and regulated. And as we look to decarbonize these, we're going to look at all kinds of alternative fuels. So in this new project that we're just starting, we're looking at fuels like hydrogen, natural gas, renewable natural gas, biodiesels, methanol, electrification, and trying to understand what the impact of that is on the pollutants coming from individual vehicles, on the air quality around those vehicles, so in the corridors and the roads, roadways where those vehicles operate, understanding the total emissions of a total freight system and where those pollutants end up. All that gets used in case studies to identify better ways of using vehicles like what I showed you today, helping us decide which fuels we use, or identifying what kind of tools we can use from a policy point of view to drive this change. But ultimately, all of this is geared at generating information, data, and knowledge that we can share with stakeholders and rights holders to make informed decisions. Which vehicle should they use? Which fuel should they use? Which type of engine should they use? And how should they use them? So with that, I'm just going to say thank you to you for your attention and for coming out this morning and highlight a few of our sponsors here. Thank you. Hello, good morning. My name is Jovana Plasic and I'm a digital designer, 3D modeler and virtual reality uh, artist who is currently applying uh, my skills in the mining sector for uh, digital twinning. So first, 
let's see what is a digital twin. So this is a virtual replica of a physical object that is connected. So these two entities are connected to a real time data exchange and transmission. So imagine similar like if you have a smartwatch that is uh, tracking your heart rate, your heartbeats. So in a way, this watch is making a digital twin of you. So in a similar way, we can place some sensors on the, for example, mining truck to get an image uh, of the health of this uh, mining truck so we can remotely access it without having to be physically present at the location. And the role of virtual reality here is that uh, this is a common medium for visualizing digital twin data. And in mining specifically, it is widely adopted uh, to conduct mine safety training. And uh, what this means for uh, sustainability as well is that we can conduct all these simulations without having to physically make these tests or make the training or uh, uh, build all this infrastructure. Uh, which would leave an environmental footprint. And also this way we're excluding the human operators from the hazardous mining site while still allowing them to be connected uh, to the site and being able to perform their uh, everyday duties uh, from a virtual environment. So let's see what would be one example um, that I'm currently working on. So here we have a digital twin for remote monitoring of mining equipment. So here on the picture, you can see a conveyor belt, which is used to transport materials between two points. And uh, because conveyor belt has a lot of rotary components, um, one of the really early warning uh, signals that something is wrong with, uh, with this conveyor belt is vibration data. So uh, here on the picture, you can see the virtual portion of the digital twin where uh, we are receiving this vibration data in real time and we can track it. And I would like to show you also some interactive tools. Um, yeah, sorry, my videos here are not working, but basically uh, what we can do is we can get um, uh, information about individual components of this conveyor belt. We can have a live video stream from the site. Uh, we can rotate it. Uh, so here we are even uh, entering uh, the sphere of spatial uh, user experience design, which is very different than uh, when we design something for uh, a two-dimensional screen, such as mobile phones or, or computers. So some more examples. And then uh, if we notice that uh, there is anything, uh, any unusual value, if there is a deviation from a preset a preset range of uh, normal values, then we would uh, get a warning uh, pop-up and we can uh, send a maintenance request via email or whatever uh, other uh, method of communication is being used on the mine site uh, so that uh, somebody who is on the physically present on the mine site can uh, actually perform uh, this maintenance. And let's see also what kind of skills uh, do I need to build something like this. So uh, first of all, digital literacy is really important. So being comfortable around technology, experimenting with technology, then interdisciplinarity. Same like Erin mentioned that in engineering, uh, we have people from uh, different uh, skills like myself. So. Um, in in a sphere like this, you need to uh, have possess some technical skills, but also some creative skills too. You need to be adaptable, so technology is developing really rapidly, and you need to always be um, able to keep up with the latest advancements. And of course, passion, just like uh, everything you do, uh, you already deep down know what are your interests and uh, what you want to do, so listen to that. And I hope that presentations like these can help to guide you uh, to see how can you apply your skill set. And in my research lab, uh, even though we are focusing on mining, we are actually working a lot with emerging technologies like 5G, uh, digital twins, industrial uh, Internet of Things, and so on. Uh, so please feel free to contact me uh, or my research supervisor if you have any further questions. Thank you.
Hi everyone, I am Hania, a PhD student at uh, UBC Okanagan, and today I'm gonna present a small voice of my research. Uh, I'm a third year PhD student in electrical engineering. Uh, also, I am a research assistant and teaching assistant at UBCO. I studied my bachelor's and master's degree in electrical engineering at Amir Kabi University of Technology, Tehran Polytechnic. And I am in the Okanagan lab for control systems research under the supervision of Professor Ahmad al -Dabba. My research focus is cybersecurity and fault diagnosis in network systems. And let's see what motivated me for my research. The same battle. Uh, Throughout the history, people have learned to defend their own uh, community and society against threats and incidents that, hap uh, that happen. Nowadays, it's the same. We need to defend our own, but, but the wars that we are in are much more complicated and dangerous. And as, uh, as an electrical engineer, uh, I need, I'm responsible to make sure that the system is performing uh, with security and safety. And uh, engineers, electrical engineers need to design advanced algorithms and methods to be prepared for any incidents that might happen in a system. And let's see a few examples of many incidents that have happened throughout the electrical, uh, the history of electrical systems when, uh, when the engineers haven't, uh, haven't been prepared for such incidents. For example, the New York City blackout it caused over 300 million in economic losses, also several deaths and injuries. Or Ukraine power grid attacks in 2015 and 2016, each time uh, about a quarter million of people were without electricity near uh, uh, Christmas time. Also in Canada, hackers claimed that they breached uh, networks of a Canadian gas pipeline company. So you see that uh, the environmental um, issues that these incidents cause, human impact, uh, economic losses, uh, infrastructure damage uh, that they have are significant. And to elaborate my research focus, first I need to define network system. It's a group of devices like uh, photovoltaic panels that uh, as you see in the first photo, which is a community grid in Australia, or it could be autonomous vehicles, as you see in the second photo. It, uh, also, it could be robots, drones, or any uh, or wind turbines. These devices uh, in network systems are connected together throughout uh, the communication links. And this working together leads the system to operate in a more efficient way. However, it comes with consequences. When uh, there is a problem in one of these involved devices, it's going to impact the whole system and the whole network, like chain reaction. In my bachelor's and master's research, I focus on controller um, methods for power systems, but they only valid as long as there is no anomaly in the system. As an electrical engineer, we need to make sure that the system is going toward its pre-designed performance. However, if there is an anomaly in the system, like false or cyber physical attacks, the system is going to diverge from its um, efficient performance. But what's the difference of a fault and, and cyber physical attack? Fault is an unexpected issue that happens in the system, but uh, attacks are planned intentional actions that could be even far more dangerous than faults in the systems. And as you see in, uh, in the diagram, researchers have been trying to block these um, incidents that have happened uh, in, uh, throughout the time. And in my research, I focus on identifying uh, anomalies in the system. After, uh, after uh, detecting that there is something, uh, that there is some problem in the system, we need to uh, find out which kinds of, kinds of anomalies uh, have happened in the system. It could be multiple faults or multiple incidents, multiple cyber attacks, so we need to distinguish between them to take countermeasures. Uh, and as, as network system could be large uh, and vast in a huge area like microgrids or smart grids, we need to accurately locate the origin of the problem. We cannot just simply shut down the whole network because of an anomaly and alarm in the system. 
And as the last step of my research, which is a new and interesting area in this world, we try to make things work again. It means that the system has been disrupted by anomalies and it's not operating in its efficient, method, uh, efficient way. So we need to uh, come up with these algorithms and methods to make sure that it's going to come back to its normal, uh, to its normal um, design. All these steps are done uh, doing mathematical tools, uh, the models of the system, or data-driven methods. Here is a photo of the research group that I'm uh, in, and I want to extend my appreciation to my supervisor, Professor Ahmed al Dabba. Uh, also, there is my email address. I'd be glad to answer all your questions if I can. And thank you for listening to my presentation. Hi, I am Dr. Elise Kieser, and I am a microbial ecologist by training, uh, which means I work in big data sets, and I try to understand how to use, uh, take approaches for next generation bioremediation using microbial communities for sustainable development. So you're probably wondering, how do microbial communities fit into engineering? Well, there's the traditional bioremediation approach that kind of finds an Sorry, it seems like we lost your audio just for a second. Is that better? Yes. Okay, all right. Um, so the traditional bioremediation approaches take, um, often find a single organism, like a bacteria or fungi, and they say, oh my gosh, it degrades plastic. Um, we have the answer. However, while that works in the lab, it can work in the field. So our idea that one, one organism can solve our problems is really um, false. So my research looks at how to use microbial communities because in the environment, microbes actually live in very complex communities. They have dynamic interactions with the environment and with each other. And the resources and wastes that they use are recycled and repurposed to meet nutritional constraints of that environment. So they respond directly to the environment that they're in, and they actually coordinate with each other, similar to a network. And this what is what we kind of call a circular bioeconomy amongst themselves. So they recycle goods. They have an example of how we can do that the same way, or we can go out and find where these communities work and use them for advantage. So my research starts by listening to the smallest units of life. Uh, and in order to do that, we go out to various environments like wetlands, uh, which is very similar to um, anaerobic digestion that turns organic waste into methane, And we look at how the microbes are doing that there. And then we use, um, data visualization processes, we use big data processing, bioinformatics, uh, microbiology, geochemistry, and we pull this all together into our engineering context so that we can, uh, we can start to use what microbes do naturally within our bioprocesses and, and design environments such that they can promote microbes that will be able to address problems like microplastic waste, tire wear particles. So can we design the sides of roads that will collect the waste that's on them and bring them into almost a bioreactor that's growing right there because it's part of the natural community of microbes that live there. And can we encourage them to break down the toxins and the contaminants before that's led into the environment? So my research really is at the, um, interface between very fundamental science and very applied science. So we look to understand the circular bioeconomy of microbial communities in natural environments and predict even impacts of climate on what those microbes are doing. 
And then we can also take um, those and mimic this cellular economy that microbes use within engineered environments to produce more stable bioprocesses. Thank you very much. Perfect. Thank you so much, everyone. So I'm going to pull everyone back onto the stage to answer your questions. Um, and so I will do that now. Perfect. So I always learn so much from all these presentations. I really appreciate um, you all sharing this little bit of research. I know you could all probably talk forever about this research. So thank you so much for shortening it into just a few minutes for us to get some great insight into some of the things that you do. We do have a question that came in that says, how does UBC get connected to places where professors and students can do field research? So maybe for any of you that have gone into your field to do that research, you can talk a little bit about what that maybe looks like. Go I can speak to that. Um, often there's, um, I partner with a lot of government agencies that are already running um, long-term like observations. So Ministry of Forests or Department of Fisheries and Oceans. Um, they already have a lot of people in place and we can go in and add our, um, you know, whether it's a technology we're editing for monitoring or um, bring in and do a, you know, a couple seasons worth of monitoring ourselves to collect data that then, or collect samples that then we take back to the lab. Um, I also work with the city of Kelowna. I'm located in the Okanagan and uh, we have a lot of what are called living labs. So these are places like our wastewater treatment facility or constructed wetlands where we can return to and monitor the progress and even implement changes and see what, how that works out. Awesome. Sure, I can add a little bit too. Um, so we often, we, we kind of get it into two ways into these sort of field work um, activities. One is if we have a need that we identify and then we'll start reaching out to partners. Um, often we'll have some sort of relationship through research collaborations already. Um, in other cases, it's where a partner will have a problem or a question and they need an answer from uh, from sort of a, a third party that has no bias. And that's what a university is great for. So they'll, they'll reach out and ask us, for example, what are the, what's the, a good fuel for this application? And we can look at it very objectively. Um, we do have research institutes, clean energy research centers, the one I'm associated with. And there we have um, research advisory boards that includes people from industry. And so they help us make those connections as well. It's a great question. Awesome, thank you. Um, another question that we often get from students and uh, is kind of how can undergraduate students get involved in research? Do you have any undergraduate students that work in any of your labs? Um, are there ways that you've seen undergraduate students get involved in research? Uh, is there advice that you have for them if they are looking to get involved in research later on? Sure. I'm, I'm happy to comment on that. Um, yeah. We love having undergrads in our research lab. So they'll often join us for a summer term. Um, and that can be many different ways that can be just uh, sometimes volunteering, but usually it's a paid position. Um, sometimes it's an award through an NSERC, which is our federal funding agency. Uh, sometimes it's through a, a course program. We In the mechanical engineering department, we have a Create You, which is an undergraduate research experience program. Um, or sometimes it's a, a course itself. We have a, a fourth year course where students can work on a research project all year. Um, if you're interested in it, the single best thing you can do is talk to professors. Professors, as you saw today, love to talk about their research all day long, any day. So if you're interested, knock on a door, talk to them after class. Uh, they will be happy to talk to you about research. Awesome, thank you. Did anyone else wanna share any of their experiences working with any undergrad students? All right. Well, thank you all so much for being here today. I really appreciate all of you sharing some of your research so that we can learn more about all of the amazing things that UBC Engineering is able to look into and innovate and make our world a better place. So I really appreciate you all being here today. We're going to uh, come off this. Oh, sorry. I have one more question that came in. Maybe we have uh, time to answer that one. So. Uh, I mentioned at the beginning of the opening for this that uh, a lot of the research that happens in UBC engineering and within UBC as a whole is very interdisciplinary. So one of the questions says, do you invite teachers or researchers from other specializations to ever 
uh, either work with you or even to share some of that research in the class that you may be teaching. Yes, for example, um, oh. go ahead. No, I'm already, go ahead. <laughs> yeah, I, uh, I think that engineering is a really interdisciplinary field. And yes, uh, I feel like we have students with different uh, skill sets who have, who maybe did undergrad in one thing, but then transitioned into a new thing. And then, uh, of course, there will be research partners, other scientists who are involved. Um, so yes, it is definitely a collaboration between people with different areas of expertise. Awesome. Did anyone else want to add? Uh, yeah, I would say um, in my upper level courses, I teach a course where um, I, you know, students identify some of the environmental challenges and how uh, microbial processes might be able to address that. And, and part of that is bringing in researchers um, uh, from the from other disciplines as well as um, bringing in people you know from the city who actually manage some of the the, the facilities that we're looking at having challenges with. Um, my research itself is extremely interdisciplinary. I work with geoscientists and uh, um, informaticians and um, all molecular biologists and mathematicians. So it gets really exciting. Awesome. Well, with that, I will say thank you so much. We are just about out of time now. And so we are going to leave the stage for just a minute. We'll be right back with our co-op and career experience. So don't go anywhere if you're watching us. But again, a huge thank you to all of the researchers that were able to provide a spotlight into what their research is today. Thank you all so much. Um, and we'll be right back with the co-op and career experience presentation.